So Paul, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us at the conference. Let me start, if I could, by uh, asking you about um, your involvement with the Blueprint Project. Yeah. You've been very close to it from the beginning. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about why uh, you got involved and why you think it's potentially so important? Okay, I'll start with the honest story of how I got involved in this specifically with the uh, then Bishop, now Cardinal, Vincent uh, Nichols has a lot to do with it because I was in uh, my office in London, one of these rare occasions, and my secretary said, there's a phone call from the bishop. So I had a few people in my Rolodex called bishop, but I didn't know that the bishop was able to call me. <laughs> so I thought about it for about a nanosecond, and I know I have to prepare myself for my afterlife as well and keep my options open. <laughs> so I quickly said, we better take this call. You never know what's going to happen later. And then we had a talk on the phone, and, and you were basically explaining to me something that we've all tossed with, how people are uh, conflicted in life. You expressed it very well at that time, that uh, people leave their house and kiss their kids goodbye and their wives, etc., and then have a certain standards and values. And then, obviously, when they get to work, they don't get to express that. I think that's one of the main reasons why you see these issues of mental health going up and people being conflicted. So we've tossed about that at Unilever as well and, and obviously thought about these issues uh, equally and uh, we, we thought it was a good idea to bring a group of business people, like-minded business people together to really uh, share some of these learnings and t start to think a little bit about a different business model. Now this came at a very appropriate time. I'm talking about two years ago, if I may say. And then we had the dinner about 18 months ago and, and really kicked off the project, but it's really a lot of other people that did it. But if you, um, when I became a CEO in 2009, it was just after this uh, financial crisis in 2008, 2007, 2008, and it became increasingly clear to a lot of people that the way we were doing things obviously had been tremendous in terms of lifting enormous, people, enormous amounts of people out of poverty. I don't think we should be ashamed of what we have been doing in the, in the 80s or 90s. But because of this enormous uh, explosion in population, because of this enormous wealth explosion in some other parts of the world that didn't have as many chances as we obviously have had in this part of the world, there were certain pressures that had come together uh, and ultimately led to this crisis in 2007-2008. And what many more people realized was that uh, we had to adjust things we were doing. And to me, it was very clear that um, we were able to um, lift uh, certain amounts of people out of poverty, but we were leaving too many people behind. We were playing with our planetary boundaries. We were doing this at an enormous cost in terms of public and private debt. So uh, frankly, not sustainable. And business had to become, had become too myoptically focused in, uh, on, on shareholder value uh, and short-term <coughs> short termism that actually has uh, undermined a little bit the fabric of what this process was meant to be in the first place. And that happened and that gradually came to us over the 80s and the 90s and frankly served a lot of us well but left a lot of people behind. And increasingly these people, if you look at it, were able or are able to connect themselves and make their voices heard. So any business, which is really my spiel, any business would do well to listen to these voices because ultimately uh, no business has been invented for the shareholders. No? Uh, uh, and if there are a few exceptions, you might say, where people invent businesses for their own benefit, they usually don't have a long life anyway. So businesses have originally and have always been there to try to solve problems, to deal with challenges in society and try to find an answer and be efficient. And that's why it's also fairly normal to me what Luis was talking about. If you are there to serve society instead of your shareholders, and you take really that point of view, you have to say, what am I serving? And what you're serving is trying to make humanity better. That gives you a reason for being. Um, and that has always been underlying any economic theory, to be honest. Where we got off the, off the rails was a little bit with the Milton Friedman's of this world, of the business for business is business that comments. And then this enormous pressure on the financial market chasing returns that I think has, has uh, created some rules of the game that, that have led to dysfunctional behavior. Unilever has been fortunate in, in the sense, and one of the appeals I had in joining this company six years ago was that if you go back to the uh, original days of the founder owners of these companies anywhere, be it the Cadbury's or the, uh, or the, 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 the Unilever's or many others, uh, Lord Lever in this case, 
uh, they were driven by, by indeed this deeper purpose of attacking these problems of society. And that is very much in the culture of our company. In our case, it was bar soap to attack the issues of hygiene in Victoria and Britain. And, uh, and even we have lost our mojo sometimes. And what we are trying to do now is really get that back. And, and this, um, you can be um, governed by rules and regulations and laws, but it doesn't serve anything if people's morality is not at the, at the right level. And what was clear in the 2007, 2008 crisis, at the end of the day, not many people went to jail. Uh, so, so I concluded it's an issue of morality and ethics. And, and this blueprint for better business is, is a great example to get the dialogue out, but also then to not only get the dialogue out, but to give people some practical tools to, and the, these five, five commitments, if you call it that way, practical tools to put that into action in the conflict. Could you tell us a little bit about how you've been putting them into action at Unilever? You've been fairly active at Unilever for many years on several fronts. What, what role are the principles playing and, and where are you on that, on that yeah. journey? Well, I think the overarching principle, uh, it puts it nicely in the middle of that chart, is that business has to be for the long term and sustainable. If you look at the average length of a company's life now is only 18 years. It's actually very scary. And in fact, there are actually less companies out there. If you think what the function of companies is, including providing these solutions, but other functions are providing pensions. Uh, companies' profits provide tax to governments so that we can get some public services. There are really some very good purposes for companies. In fact, 90% of the world's jobs are created by companies. Now, 80% of the capital flow comes from companies, especially at a time when European and, 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 and the US, which have been main, main providers of funds, are actually shrinking back. The role of business is even more important. So, this notion of that we need to create companies for the long term is extremely important. So the first thing I did when I entered Unilever was make that very clear to our own people by abolishing quarterly reporting, by abolishing guidance, and not get into this uh, habit of being, uh, being uh, ruled and victimized by some people who call themselves owners. But that increasingly, in my opinion, is a warped concept of what shareholders are. Uh, the average length of uh, holding shares in companies like ours has come down to four and a half months. It's not even a cycle of an annual report. Obviously, there are long-term shareholders that we prefer, but there are many that are basically playing Las Vegas, and, and you should not run your company like that. Unfortunately, what we now see, even today, the pressures are higher. The amounts of companies that now borrow because it's, it's cheap, do share buybacks or split companies to gain short-term returns, I think is a very dangerous thing in society. So then the second thing you need to do is how do you differentiate yourself in a, in a, in a, once you create an environment for people to behave a little bit lo more long term, how do you create a deeper purpose that gets people up in the morning? And uh, whilst we like to increase our market share of personal or get more people to use that, I'm sure that when the day comes that I pass on, I don't want the people to say, you know, he increased the profit by 10 basis points or he grew Duff by uh, half a point market share. Uh, people want to say, you know, we made a difference. We, we inherited this company, we left it in a better state, we uh, came to this world, we, we helped uh, improve the situation for people that couldn't help themselves, whatever it is. And we came up with this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which basically said uh, something I've always strongly felt, we decouple our growth from environmental impact and we uh, increase our social impact. Now, it sounds all noble, it's not easy, we said we do this over a 10 year period, but we did two other things that I think were frightening for us, but actually very enlightening at the same time. We said we can't do it alone because the task, I'd never heard of a company of that size or magnitude that had made such an audacious promise. In fact, I should have told you, uh, Rebecca, we made this promise across our total value chain because it was very clear to me that the CSR focus, which we should not be little, but it really focuses on, on your own factories and your plans. You might have to include your travel. It usually is a person very close to retirement that gets an office, and I call it page two of the annual report. But we shouldn't belittle it, it's needed, but it's not enough anymore. So we said as a company, you have to take responsibility or core responsibility of your total value chain. In our case, it would be from farmer to fork. So we issued this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan uh, with some, uh, some targets and goals and said we can't do it alone and we don't have all the answers. That made us all of a sudden a human company because I don't think there are many CEOs that will go public and say we don't have all the answers. Or that we need to work in partnership, as Luisa eloquently explained. And that helped us to the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. 
We said we want to have all of our agricultural based materials sustainably sourced. We want to reach another billion people, improving their health and well being. It sounded like a lot, but we have about 2 billion people a day using our products, and we reach about 7 out of 10 households globally. So I think that's a target we can go for. And to um, totally decouple growth from an overall environmental impact. So with it behind that, we put 50 targets. We, we, we share those with people, we measure them, we get input. Uh, including from many of the NGOs and civil society, and we're making this this program work. Now we're in in year four of the journey, and um, I should have mentioned. I apologize, but uh, we next to abolishing the quarters and the longer term, I also made it very clear that our focus is not to uh, drive shareholder return. Our focus really is to make a positive contribution to society, but then figure out how we could do it in such a way that the shareholder would also benefit. So it is a different mindset, but it requires a different action uh, and activity system behind that. So that's what we did. Now, in, in a nutshell, in, uh, in four years' time, we are now about 50% sustainably sourced. After 150 years in business, we were 10% sustainably sourced five years ago. And we were already winning all the prices because we had started a round table of sustainable palm oil, or the marine stewardship of sustainable fishery, or the sustainable agriculture initiative. And you name it, we were part of it. We were only 10%, now we're 50%. We were reaching 50 million people with hand washing and oral care and nutritional programs. Uh, now we've reached 303 million people. So you see what energy does when you set these targets high, when you create this deeper purpose, you're able to achieve things that probably are not, not uh, otherwise achievable. All of our factories, green energy, no waste, the concept of circular economy is, is uh, increasingly implemented in the rest of our businesses. So it does something. And it does something also to your brand in the outside world. Uh, with Globescan, uh, we, we are uh, being seen as a, as a company probably that is a little bit farther ahead than many others. And it attracts partners. It allows you to do things you otherwise couldn't be doing. Uh, the challenge in this society, for example, is if, um, uh, if you want to reach the bottom three and a half billion, unfortunately, it's still the bottom three and a half billion. Two and a half billion people, no access to clean drinking water or sanitation. One billion people going to bed hungry. You know, 65% of the work for, of the global population in marginal jobs. I can give you many more statistics. At the end of the day, it boils down to the bottom three and a half, where business cannot really get to without really challenging their economic viability. It's too expensive. They don't have the capabilities. That part of the economy doesn't have enough purchasing power to make it interesting. And that's why a lot of these people have been left behind. What we are now seeing is that by working in partnership with USAID, with DFID, with Oxfam, Save the Children, we can actually get to projects that make a lot of sense, that get us a billion, a billion and a half, two billion deeper, that actually drive our business, which is a good thing because you need that uh, to be sustainable. That's the other aspect of sustainable. It drives our business, but also it actually improves society. And that's ultimately the ultimate goal for all of us, that we put our interest a little bit aside and focus on the interest of the common good, which actually goes to the essence of this this purpose that the uh, Blueprint for Better Business is trying to address. So I wish there was some way to share with the group here um, the way in which inside Unilever you rigorously balance this concern for purpose with making sure that the business is still healthy and strong. And yes. I've had the pleasure of watching you work with your team and you're very much holding these two and making sure that uh, purpose translates to, uh, to business success and, and vice versa. Can I ask you a slightly harder question? So sometimes, well, I'll give you a specific example. I was at a dinner party here in England last uh, few weeks ago, and there was a foreign journalist there, quite well known, you know the name. And I said, I teach a course called Reimagining Capitalism, Business and the Big Problems. And he looked at me and he said, that must be a little like being the Syrian tourist minister. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ignore the bombs that are falling over there. You know, we have all these beautiful things to show you. And, and he said, well, come on, Rebecca, you know, I'm sure there are businesses that are purpose-driven. I'm sure you know business in its natural state does a lot of good. But until we change some of the rules, it's going to be hard for business to do the good it could do. Um, carbon would be, you know, global warming would be a classic example. But do we also need to change the institutions that surround right. business to really make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Sense? And I think his question is right. Mm -hmm. I always, when you get these questions, and when mm -hmm. I was listening to you, I always differentiate between. Uh, critics and cynics. Mm -hmm. I personally don't have any time for cynics, which are people that 
that uh, don't that abdicate their own responsibility to be part of it. Critics make us all feel better and challenge us to come out there. And the, the challenges that we have in society right now of uh, climate change, you mentioned being one of them, of food security or um, our poverty alleviation in general, or, or frankly creating employment, use and employment, and uh, water sanitation are of such magnitude, otherwise they wouldn't have been there, that we clearly haven't found a way to solve it yet. So we have to solve it with everybody. And as it's very clear as there are corrupt or, or uh, dysfunctional individuals, governments, businesses, NGOs, we've seen them all, and the press has hang them out to dry, uh, you know, nearly on a weekly basis. And the more transparency is there in society with the internet, the more these people will be exposed. I sometimes get a question, is this a worse world than before? I don't think so. I actually think news travels faster and it's expo exposed quicker. And that's a good thing. I'm actually very happy with that. So the issues that we need to attack, we need to attack together. Now, how do you drive behavior? Sometimes you get people that see the light themselves and are willing to take personal risks and are fan guards in their industries or in their sectors. But unfortunately, they're far and few between. I always say we're short of leaders and trees. So we also need to be sure that we also get these uh, frameworks to function better for us. These frameworks were put in place, but like any form of capitalism, if that's what you want to use, just like Franklin Roosevelt did with his New Deal, uh, he evolved capitalism. He, in, he instituted in the US social security systems, healthcare systems. They might not all work in today's world because you know, lots of things have changed, but you evolve. And I think we've been too slow to evolve in a fast changing world. So I give you two or three examples which will be extremely helpful if we could do that. And, and there are a lot of initiatives we are involved in to get to that direction. But for example, you treasure what you measure. So if we don't measure the environmental or natural capital and social capital, we will always waste it, uh, uh, unfortunately. So we have to put a price on carbon, if you like it or not. We were very active in the carbon summit in New York uh, a few weeks ago, where the World Bank issued uh, a statement on the price of carbon. We got 52% of the world economy to sign up, 70 governments, 1,000 businesses, and the list goes on. Fortunately, more and more people are seeing that there is something happening that needs an action and, and, and uh, give less and less voice to the Koch brothers, to be honest. So, so we need to put a price on things, and the, the best thing we can do is actually go to uh, natural capital, if you want to, and uh, social capital in, on top of financial capital. Uh, the World Business Council is very active on that, Integrated Reporting Initiative, and all the other things. Uh, now, a capitalist, if you define a capitalist as someone that knows how to optimize the use of capital, if you de define how you measure social and natural capital, they will optimize that as well. The second thing we need to do is change the incentive systems around us. If we can move the financial market out of short-termism, Roger Martin wrote a book which is called Fixing the Game, which is actually worth reading. I don't know if you've read it. He teaches at the Rotham School. But it talks about all this, uh, this uh, becoming slave of the financial market and chasing returns versus chasing so chasing values, if you want to. And um, so we need to look at what we can do to reward more patient capital, how we can provide more exposure to our transparency in the financial market, how we get incentive systems in companies to be more focused on the long term, how we can get boards actively involved. All these things actually well covered by the blueprint, which makes it such a powerful document. But those are, those are definitely things we need to change in the environment. And then we need to change where you're sitting as well. We need to change the the, um, the leadership um, pool that we are creating. We're clearly not creating a sufficient amount of leadership that handles this multidimensional issue we are talking about, of economic, environmental, and social. So academic institutions are notoriously slow to change, as you well know. They're very siloed, whilst we need to be much more multidisciplinary. So the things you're doing at Harvard and many others are trying to do, we need to find a way to scale that and create these leaders of the future. And so, so there are environmental things we need to change. Is that an excuse to sit still and not do anything? Uh, you know, heck no. Uh, I've always learned that uh, if you are able to influence or if you are affected by things or can affect things, uh, then you have to do that. Uh, and, and being fortunate enough to be a CEO of a company like this, it gives you a little bit more possibilities to do it. Then you should work double as hard to do that because many people don't have that opportunity. So I think I have time to ask you one last question. And you talked about changing business schools. Um, 
We have more than 300 students signed up to take Reimagining Capitalism. That's a third of the second year class, so we're really excited about it. And we give them examples, and I talk about Unilever. We all talk about Unilever. It's a, a huge example. And people say, well, but he's the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. You know, these principles are great once you're at the top, then you can really implement them. But I'm going to go into a job. You know, I've got to work my way up. I've got to play by the rules. It's going to be 20 years before I could do anything. Could you tell us a little bit about your own journey, your own coming to purpose, and uh, when you think there's something you could, that people can do before they become the CEO? So, so um, I understand the question, but I obviously don't agree with that. And, and first of all, where I'm sitting, I can do the least. And interestingly, you know, I don't know much more about finance than my CFO, fortunately. <laughs> I don't know much more about marketing than my chief marketing officer. I don't know much more about manufacturing than my uh, head of uh, product supply. So I'm actually in a very simple position that most of the time I spent is trying to help people be successful, but it's actually them that do most of that work. So um, if you take the issue of leadership a little bit broader on, in terms of anybody who influences people, then we all can make a difference. We all can make a difference. Sometimes we cannot perhaps not scale it as quickly as, as we might be able to do, but your differences could be very impactful. In fact, I believe that many of the major changes that have happened in society have been because individuals stood up. And interestingly, they were young individuals. In most cases, they were not the old individuals, you see? So it's Rosa Parks who refused to stand up, who changed the face of racial segregation in the US. You know, it's the, it's the Gandhis or the, or the Mandelas that we call out, or, or many others. So individuals changed, not, not anything else. And it is not really related to a title of CEO. They could have called us anything, for that matter. Um, so. Everybody needs to figure out themselves what their crucible moments are, that w what their um, uh, uh, purpose is, what they, they get very excited about. And we have discussions in the company as well, even with my leadership team, where people say, well, you get excited about these things, but I not, don't get excited so much about it. Then you ask them, do you have children? Do you think that they might want to have children? Do you think that uh, they also have the right to have access to some of these scarce resources that we don't have? Are you worried about them getting employment or not? Do you think you're lucky being born in this part of the world and not in sub-Sahara, Africa, or Asia? Would you be sitting here? You know, I came from a family of six children. My father worked very hard, two jobs. Um, he didn't have any money because he got caught by the Second World War, couldn't go to university. He might have, he might not have. But the man worked himself literally to death. He died when he was 68 just to be sure that his children would go to school. And he was totally driven by, by being sure that, there was, that the next generation had it better than what they had to endure. And although they never talked too much about the Second World War, the more they passed on and the more I talked to other people, what they had to endure is not something you want to expose anybody to. And yet it happens to so many people in the world still. So they put themselves in the service of, of the common good. And what little time they had, they would spend on their church or they would spend on their communities where other people were even in a worse position. And, and that's how we grew up. And uh, then if you, if you are a product of the 70s, I was born in 56, which I always thought was a long time after the World War. Now I know how close it was. And the older I get, it seems to get closer. But, but um, uh, when we grew up in the 70s, that's actually when, when global aid and band aid and Biafra, all these things actually only started in the 70s. When people started to realize that this world was all of a sudden a connected world. Uh, it was all of a sudden a common uh, that, that our, our lives across the world were, were far more in common with the 99.9% .9 and they were differences, although perhaps at some times we wanted skin colors or language or religion to drive a big wedge. We are basically connected at the hip and, and the benefits of some parts of the world affect the others and we see that increasingly so. Most of the uh, geopolitical conflicts that we have in the world and are increasingly more of them unfortunately have their roots in poverty. And many of that poverty is being accentuated by climate change. You know, you, and you can go to any of them. Uh, and the cost of that in terms of security or instability, which is now horrendous, is being borne by everybody. So that responsibility to solve it is also by everybody. <coughs> and businesses cannot be just simple bystanders in a, in a system that gives them life in the first place, I always say. So we are such an integral part of society that we then also have to be an integral part of finding these solutions. I always am very relaxed when they say, you're a food company, so you're responsible for obesity. No, I say, no, 
I'm not responsible, but I'm co-responsible. So what can we do together to solve that? So you're a food company, so you're responsible for all these people going to bed hungry because you don't pay them enough or you don't employ enough smallholder farmers. Yeah, that's probably one part of the things that we need to be co-responsible for. Well, you're responsible for climate change because half of the deforestation in the world is because of the enormous demand of food. Yeah, that's indeed why we have to get out of this deforestation, which is 16, 17% of global warming. So Unilever finds itself involved in all of that. So in our Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, we say we want to create 5 million jobs, especially women now. Thanks to Barbara Stocking, we get into land rights and all these things and understand that better. And we say we want to create jobs for small home farmers. We're expanding our tea plantations in Africa. We probably wouldn't have done it under normal circumstances. It would be easier to buy it from the open market and get out of all these social issues. Now I say, if we can't do it, who else can do it? So it becomes really a, 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 a moral obligation. And at the same time, we are working on, you know, we have uh, uh, major progress on the issues of deforestation and hopefully get out of that at the, uh, on the other end of it and everything in between, food waste. So for example, now uh, staying with food, um, it is to me uh, morally inconceivable that we have um, 800 million people still going to bed hungry today. Uh, and actually they couldn't be here because they were too hungry, if I may be honest. Uh, whilst we waste 30 to 40 percent of the food in between and on the other hand have about to start the, the biggest epidemic in the world which is diabetes 2 with 1.2 billion people obese and then we call ourselves the most intelligent species i have a hard time understanding that so so uh, we fight very hard in my position for sure to be sure that it's on the g20 agenda that the governments work on this that the business community gets together and figure out and you know the sad part is it only costs 80 billion to feed these people and not have them go to bed hungry. And the waste of food is 500 billion. So it gets to the point now that even if you don't believe what I believe, which is perfectly fine, even if you don't grow up the way I grew up, which is perfectly fine, if you're only driven for your shareholders, you still are going to do now different things than what you were doing before because the cost of not acting now on many of these issues has become higher than the cost of acting. I believe in climate change as a big, big issue, and I believe that we need to solve that before our children have to deal with consequences that are much higher. But if you don't believe in that, it's not a problem. You can only, but you would agree on one thing, that if you don't start to attack the problem, the costs for your business would be significantly higher for most businesses, except the ones that have high carbon in their balance sheets. But, but the cost for most businesses is now higher. A company like Unilever has 400 million euros easily in extra cost now because of natural disasters a year. It's, it's every month, it's a cynical joke. Is it this month, is it the flooding or is it the frost or is it the cold or is it the drought? And, and finally, I think why the US is at the tipping point is because they see it on the East Coast, the West Coast and everything in between. I was with Jerry Brown uh, two or three weeks ago in California. They have the biggest drought. Industry is moving out because they don't have water anymore. Industry moves out, jobs move out, economies get affected. You see in China now, the reason China is under pressure and they are so aggressively looking at sustainability is because these planetary boundaries, air pollution and uh, access to natural resources are limiting their growth. And if China doesn't grow, their political system doesn't work. So we're starting to see this happening in companies, in balance sheets. And as a result, I'm actually fairly optimistic because I think even the the um, die-hard capitalist old definition CEOs, which there are plenty of, uh, are actually increasingly more easy to galvanize in action because of this cost of inaction being higher than the cost of action. The second reason I'm very positive and hopeful is that um, the young people uh, get it easily. When Unilever started this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, we get 1.8 million people applying to work for us every year. In most of the countries, we are preferred employers. We're the third most looked up company now on LinkedIn. Things that don't make any sense if you try to be rational. But if you then peel the onion, you see, yeah, these people are being, they are attracted to work for companies that have a purpose. And interestingly, the total salary bill for Unilever is less than the bonuses in the banking sector here in the city, not even anywhere else. So a total company of 175,000 people is able to motivate them, get engagement scores that are off the charts with a salary bill providing jobs, creating livelihoods, improving lives of people but, uh, that is less than the bonus, so the bonus pool of the city. And then the city complains that uh, if they have to 
do things differently in salary, they can't attract the right people. What they're really complaining about is we have a hard time finding a purpose. And what we're trying to do here is, <laughs> what we're really trying to do here with this is to have this blueprint for better business be something that helps us all, educate us all, have the conversations together, share the learnings, and drive ourselves to higher levels. And I would, I would say that for Unilever, that is as important, irrespective of where we are on the journey, because we don't have all the answers either, and the world out there is changing uh, at an enormous speed. So that um, together, I think we can create that courage that allows us to do more than perhaps each of us individually would be able to do. And that's the beauty of working together is the beauty of partnership. Uh, that's the one plus one equals 11. That's why I would encourage everybody to be part of that without any doubt. Well, it's a privilege and a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you.